Disclaimer. Newt Scamander is owned by J.K. Rowling. And so are the people who are actually in this chapter. Fudge blustered and tried to save face, but with a dozen R's and the director of the DMLE having not just witnessed, but participated in a fight against Voldemort, there was no denying what he had seen. Mr. Diggory aggressively demanding he apologize for calling Cedric mad was icing on the cake. Dumbledore was out of breath, and his robes were singed, something Hermione didn't think she'd ever seen with him before, but he got to work at once, making a port key to take the wounded students to the Hogwarts Infirmary, even though none of them were Hogwarts students anymore, which he said was safer than St. Mungo's, mainly for Harry, she suspected. Hermione asked what about Umbridge, but he assured her that everything would be fine with a twinkle in his eye, and sent them off. Hermione, Harry, Fred, and George hit the floor of the infirmary and collapsed in a heap. The low light from the torches rose, and Madame Pomfrey ran into the room, alerted by the alarm. "'Mr. Potter, Miss Granger!' she exclaimed. "'And Weasleys, what happened? Professor Vector said you were captured.' V voldemort Harry said shakily. "'Mostly Dolohov, actually,' Hermione said absently. "'If it were Voldemort, we'd be in pieces.' "'Oh dear, you're in shock,' Madame Pomfrey diagnosed. "'Come on, lie down.' "'Lee's dead.' George said hoarsely. What? Dolohov killed him. Not Lee Jordan, Pomfrey said in horror. George nodded sadly. Fred seemed unable to speak. Hermione couldn't imagine what they were feeling right now. Lee was almost as close with the twins as they were with each other. She lay back on the bed, only half aware of her surroundings, until Madame Pomfrey came over and waved her wand at her. <sighs> she said. Broken clavicle, two broken ribs, one cracked, ruptured spleen, extensive bruising down the right side, dark magic residue, mild exhaustion. Have you taken any potions, Miss Granger? Uh, a cure for nosebleed nougat. Ah, yes, that. Good thinking there. But what happened to your side? Some kind of curse, she said. Dolohov cast it. I don't know what it was, but it was purple, and it was the same one that killed Lee. Sweet Merlin, Pomfrey gasped. You're lucky to be alive. You know it? Of course I know it. Hemorrhaging curse. It's Dolhov's specialty. Lord knows I saw it enough last time. It can kill if it hits a vulnerable spot like the head of the neck. Otherwise, it's survivable if you get to a hospital fast enough. But how did you not have your liver torn apart by it? Basilisk skin coat, ma'am. It absorbed most of it. Lee wasn't so lucky. I'm very sorry for your loss, Miss Granger, she said. The good news is it was diluted enough that you should be back on your feet in a few days. She mended her broken bones and considered for a moment. Yes, I think that will do it, she said to herself. She left briefly and returned with four potions. One was for the pain, she said. One was to repair her spleen. One for the curse damage. And the fourth was a sleeping draught. You have quite enough damage to be getting on with, but those should have you healing up quite nicely. And I think you'll get away without any scarring. Hermione shrugged, not particularly caring at the moment. As she drifted off to sleep, she muttered, You should see the other guy. When Hermione woke, it was to the murmuring of voices and sunlight streaming in through the windows. She felt groggy, and she guessed that, potion or no, she had only been asleep for a few hours. The pain was much better, though. She felt something brush her hand, and she looked over to see George fast asleep in a chair by her bedside, his flopped on the sheets where he must have been holding her hand. Even in sleep, his eyes were red from exhaustion, and tears if she didn't miss her guess. She reached over and squeezed his hand, causing him to wake up. "'Hey there, beautiful. You're up,' he said with a weak smile. "'Yeah,' she said. "'Thank you for saving us. "'I'll always come to save you, Hermione.' And Harry's practically our brother, so we couldn't leave him either. She half smiled, but it vanished quickly. George, I'm so sorry about Lee, she started. It's not your fault, he said. He made his choice. We all did. I wasn't going to leave you behind, and neither was he. But he wasn't in the Order. He didn't even know about the Order. We might have told him more than we let on to the rest of you. And he was in the D.A. anyway. He was prepared to fight. Still, she looked down at her hands, I wasn't expecting to do any real fighting. I mean, 
I was preparing for it, but I, I don't think I was ready. I don't think anyone is when the time comes, George said softly. Hell, do you think Mom and Dad were ready tonight? Dad probably had to stun Mom to get her to calm down. We just have to keep doing the right thing like Dumbledore says. Hermione refrained from saying what she thought of Dumbledore. She knew it, probably, wasn't his fault that he came too late. She had no idea where he had been hiding out, and he had probably gone to check on the prophecy first, but she still had significant disagreements with him from the past year. "'How are you and Fred doing?' she asked. George sighed and blinked back tears. "'I, I don't know,' he said. "'I just can't believe he's gone. I'm scared for what's going to happen next, and part of me just wants to be selfish and be happy I didn't lose you or Fred. I mean, I really thought my life was over when I saw you get hit.' and I can't even think about losing Fred. I know, I don't know what I'll do without you or Harry. She shook her head. The war was getting too personal too fast. How's Harry? She changed the subject. Still sleeping, but Madame Pomfrey says he'll be fine. Ron and Ginny were in here for a little while. I didn't know they were awake, but I guess things were pretty crazy here last night? Hermione nodded. The R's tried to arrest Hagrid, and they nearly killed Professor McGonagall. What? McGonagall? How? Why? She tried to get them away from Hagrid. They hit her with a bunch of stunners, which I guess they weren't supposed to do. Also, Hagrid's been hiding a giant in the forest. A giant? Bloody hell. You miss a little at Hogwarts, and you miss a lot. Do you know what happened to Luna? Luna? Good morning, Hermione. I'm glad to see you're still alive. Luna was sitting in a hospital bed across from her. She looked around and spotted Harry sleeping and Fred sitting in the corner, looking almost catatonic. "'Luna, what happened to you?' she said. "'I'm afraid Dolores Umbridge used the Cruciatus curse on me.' "'She didn't!' Hermione gasped. "'That's illegal!' "'I think the DA pushed her too far. She's normally more careful than that.' "'My God, are you all right, Luna?' "'Oh, yes. I wasn't under very long. Neville saved me very quickly.' but Madame Pomfrey wanted me to stay here overnight. Neville? Okay, now I think I've missed a lot. Hello, they heard Harry call. What's going on? Harry, you're awake? Uh-huh, he pushed himself up in the bed. Oh, what's happening? Is everyone all right? Depends what you mean by all right, she replied. But I don't think anything's changed from last night. R Remus was hurt, though. It didn't look too bad. I can try to call someone with my ring. She reached for her wand, but she quickly realized that her robes had been switched for a hospital gown, and her wands were nowhere to be found. She checked her garter. It was gone, with her holdout wand. George, where are my wands? I... Uh, George, where are my wands? She said urgently. I, I don't know. I think Madame Pomfrey took them. Madame Pomfrey! She called loudly. She was starting to feel nervous, in spite of her better reason. Madame Pomfrey hurried back into the room. "'I see you two are up,' she said. "'How are you feeling?' "'Much better, ma'am. Physically, I mean,' Hermione said. "'But could I get my wands back, please?' "'Wands, plural,' she said skeptically. "'Yes, ma'am.' "'So there's a reason you came in here with four wands on your person?' Four? Oh, right, the homemade one.' Uh, the two with the spiral designs and the plain one are mine. I never carry just one anymore. The one that looks like it was chewed by an animal is Walden McNair's, I think. McNair? I'm sure there's a very entertaining story there, Pomfrey said sarcastically. And, Mr. Potter, you had an extra wand on your person that was a good eighteen inches long. Dare I ask where you found that? Compensating for something, Harry, George said. Harry glared at him, but then he smiled. Not me. That was Lucius Malfoy's. George laughed weakly, and Madame Pomfrey rubbed her forehead in frustration. I'd really feel safer if I had my wands back, Madame Pomfrey, Hermione pressed. Very well, she sighed, but don't cast any taxing magic for a few days. You need to rest. She retrieved her and Harry's wands and gave them back to them. Now, I'll have to let some visitors in before I get overrun, but I expect you two to get back to sleep right after breakfast. Uh, yes, ma'am, Hermione said sheepishly. Madame Pomfrey opened the doors with a stern warning to the people standing outside about limited visiting hours, 
and Ron, Ginny, and Neville rushed into the room. Harry! Ginny exclaimed. She ran to his side and kissed him. Oh, thank God! Hey, Ginny, he said. I was so worried when Professor Vector told us you were taken. What happened? Yeah, good question, Ron said, approaching George and Hermione. We heard about Lee. I can't believe it. It was Dolohov, George growled. The one that got Uncle Fabian and Uncle Gideon. He's got it in for the whole family. Bloody hell! Hermione, what happened down there? Let's hear yours first, she said. I'm guessing it's shorter. Ron and Ginny blushed. Oh, said Ginny. Well, Professor Vector told Ron, Dean, and Neville you were in trouble, and she needed to get word to the Auras. So they assembled everyone who was awake from the DA, and we got together and attacked Umbridge to get her out of the way. You all did that for us? Hermione asked with wide eyes. Wait a minute. Why did you have to attack Umbridge? Why not just sneak Septim out of the castle? Ginny blushed harder. Um, I kind of overreacted. I was mad at her for making you two go home alone, and... Yeah. So Umbridge fought back, but she couldn't fight all of us, and she lost it, and... And she cast the Cruciatus Cursed blindly and hit Luna, she said sadly. I about wanted to kill her, but Neville got to her first and blasted her halfway across the Great Hall with one spell. Hermione looked in amazement at Neville, who was sitting by Luna's bedside. Who knew he had that in him? He nodded solemnly when he saw her eyes on him. I, I think I might have killed her, he said. Professor Vector took her to St. Mungo's and all, but she wasn't moving, and then I found out I'd burnt out my wand. It was my dad's wand. Gran's gonna kill me, he muttered. Burnt out his wand? From what Hermione knew, that could only happen if his wand had been working under a lot of strain for years. Maybe it was a poor fit for him? She searched for something to say to make him feel better. Oh, well, I think I killed Bellatrix, she said. Neville choked and stared at her in shock, as did most of the other occupants in the room, but then another voice said, In fact, you did not. They turned in surprise as Albus Dumbledore entered the infirmary. Neither of you, I mean. For better or worse, my various sources tell me that both Dolores Umbridge and Bellatrix Lestrange are very much alive. She is, Hermione said. But how? My curse should have killed her. Dumbledore's face fell disapprovingly. I do not know the details, but I have it from a reliable source. This, of course, meant Professor Snape. That Augustus Rookwood was able to reverse the spell. That's not exactly what I meant, Professor. I used a heart-stopping curse. Rookwood knows how to fix ventricular fibrillation? Dumbledore's gaze darkened further. Hermione, I do not believe this is the proper time or place to discuss this, he said. Suffice it to say that, as an unspeakable, Rookwood knows many things most wizards don't. Oh, sorry, Professor, she muttered. She then noticed George was staring at her worriedly. A heart-stopping curse? he asked. Yes, I got the idea from one of my parents' medical textbooks, she said. You see, the way the heart functions... Miss Granger, Dumbledore cut her off. Never mind, she blushed as she realized it was probably best not to explain how the spell worked. I apologize for breaking up this discussion, he continued, but there are some aspects to last night's events that I feel should be handled privately before they are spread about. I will, of course, wait for you to recover further before fully debriefing you, as they say. For now, I merely wish to report to you the current situation. I'm guessing you're back as headmaster, Hermione said. Indeed. Dolores Umbridge has been arrested for use of an unforgivable curse, and Minister Fudge no longer has the power to protect her. She will be going to Azkaban, and Educational Decrees number 21 through 32 will be repealed by evening. I have also taken the liberty of reinstating Professors Trelawney and Hagrid. Harry, both your expulsion and your lifetime ban from Quidditch have been revoked, and you will, of course, both be permitted to make up your muggle studies and history of magic examinations that were scheduled for today. Thank you, Professor, she replied, though she didn't much care about those at this point. Now, Mr. Jordan's body has been taken to his family, he continued. I deeply regret that I could not do more to save him but I am pleased to report that all of our other people will make a full recovery. As for the Death Eaters, since I am sure you are wondering, they all survived, although I cannot speak to their current conditions. Six were arrested at the scene, while six others escaped. Bellatrix? 
I'm afraid so, along with Rookwood. It was those who were incapacitated who left the battle before the Rs could apprehend them. But despite everything that happened, I want to commend you, all of you. You kept the weapon out of Voldemort's hands, and you also rescued Harry and Hermione, as well as revealing Voldemort's return to the Ministry. It may be hard to accept, but last night was more of a victory than a defeat. It certainly didn't feel like a victory, even though she could see his reasoning. Sir, could you tell my parents I'm all right? Actually, never mind, I'll have Dobby do that. But could you ask Professor Slughorn to come up to the castle and talk to me as soon as he can? I still need to talk to him about that special project you mentioned. Of course, Hermione, if you think this would be an opportune time and you're up to it. For now, I will leave you to your breakfast. I will call on you again when you are more rested. Ta-ta, all of you. After Dumbledore left, Hermione and Harry gave the others an overview of their story. Neville and Ginny in particular were awestruck at Hermione's skills. Ginny asked if she could teach her some of the spells she described, albeit in vague terms, to which Hermione cautiously agreed. Over breakfast, Hermione called Dobby and asked him to report back to her parents that she was okay, that some bad things had happened that she would have to explain later because she'd been up all night and needed to sleep, but the danger had passed and she might or might not be staying at Hogwarts for the next week until term ended. Her parents' response, delivered through Dobby, who did a frighteningly good impression of her mother, was, "'You have a lot of explaining to do, young lady. You are supposed to stay out of danger this year, and you can't just leave us with some bad things happened. You'd better come home right away to discuss this, or else.' Her reply to that, she decided to put in a note so that she could suppress her more annoyed reactions, although she wasn't sure it worked. "'Dear Mum and Dad, I apologize for frightening you, but... Some bad things happened is a pretty apt description. Yes, Harry and I found ourselves in danger last night, but it wasn't from us being irresponsible. It was the Ministry screwing things up so badly that there was no one else responsible around to help us. The good news is that the Ministry just got its head pulled out of its collective ass, Dumbledore's back, etc., etc., so it won't happen again. The bad news is that one of my friends died last night, Lee Jordan. I don't know if you ever met him, but he was George's and Fred's best friend and he helped save me and Harry. If it makes you feel better, you should know that I gave better than I got last night. I really do need to sleep, so I'll write you later to explain more. Love from Hermione. P.S. Please see Madame Pomfrey's note that I should stay here till the end of term for treatment. No, my injuries weren't that bad, but I got hit with a spell that needs magic to fully fix. P.P.S. Also, I still have to take my makeup exams. Yeah, that kind of got away from her. Either way, it was easy to convince Madame Pomfrey to write the note. When asked, Dobby also admitted that he couldn't hear her when she called for him in the Department of Mysteries. He was distraught by the thought that he'd failed her and even tried to punish himself, but she stopped him and assured him it wasn't his fault. That seemed to settle things for the moment. Most of her friends had left by then, leaving only Neville behind. Hermione, he said, I just wanted to say thanks, you know, for trying to get Bellatrix. Thanks, Neville, she answered. I did my best. I just wish Voldemort didn't have someone as smart as Rookwood with him. Yeah, me too. After breakfast, Hermione slept again until mid-afternoon, at which time Madame Pomfrey reluctantly got her and Harry out of bed. If I had my way, you'd be here till tomorrow morning, she grumbled. But the headmaster insisted that you had critical work to do that couldn't wait because the end of term is so close. He wants to see you now, Miss Granger, and Mr. Potter to join you in half an hour. But I want to see both of you back here twice a day for continued treatment, you understand? Yes, ma'am, Hermione said. She walked up to the headmaster's office. Her legs were fine, but she still felt achy all around her chest and down her right side. The bruises, caused by dark magic, would take time to heal. She managed the walk with little trouble, though. When she reached the office, she was surprised to find Septima and Professor Snape had joined them. An odd combination, to be sure, but she was mainly excited to see her favorite teacher again. Septima, she said, rushing forward to hug her. Hermione, thank Merlin you're all right, Septima said, hugging her back. I was so worried when I saw your message. I did what I could, but I was afraid it was too late. I had other help, but thank you, she said. Snape cleared his throat. If you are done with this sentimental display... Really, Severus, Septima said. Hermione's been through a traumatic experience. 
She is far from the only one, Septima, and we have more important matters to discuss. Then by all means, she said coldly. Headmaster? Quite. Dumbledore fixed his eyes on Hermione, and she automatically began practicing occlumency in case he tried to get into her head. Hermione, he said, I asked you here because I have heard Professor Snape's report of what the returning Death Eaters told Voldemort last night, and I confess I am concerned by the dark nature of the spells you employed against them. I understand your situation was dire, but some of the things he told me were, frankly, disturbing. That is why I wanted to discuss the matter with you right away. I asked Professor Vector to come as well, since I believe several of these were spells you crafted yourself. Hermione looked at Septim questioningly. I don't know the details, she said, only that the headmaster was concerned about it. What did you do? Hermione eyed Snape warily. Someone said he was on their side, but... Everyone said he was on their side, but he was a double agent. She didn't think it would be wise to trust him completely. Perhaps you should explain what happened to the Death Eaters, Professor, she said. I didn't exactly stay to watch the aftermath. Snape inclined his head appraisingly. Bellatrix Lestrange apparently suffered heart failure from her curse, but is now more or less recovered due to Rookwood's intervention. Avery suffered severe lacerations from the trap that you set, and two others suffered minor injuries. Mulciber looks like he was shot by a muggle shotgun, and I would like to know what the hell you did to Dolohov. Ah, I'm guessing he's not having a very good day, she ventured. The man looks like he's been skinned alive, Granger. He was howling like you'd set him on fire, and the Dark Lord was not happy that I didn't know how to heal him. Well, don't expect me to tell you, Professor. I'm not going to give him any help. Hermione, Dumbledore said. Perhaps you could explain your choice of spells last night. Hermione, did you really do all that? Septima asked with concern. Yes, Septima, I did, she replied. If you must know, Headmaster, I set traps involving high-test cutting wires at several locations in the Department of Mysteries to slow down our pursuers, which is what Avery stumbled into. I used a fractal piercing hex on Mulciber. I used a heart-stopping curse on Bellatrix, and I used an extremely powerful blistering curse on Dolohov. However, I'm not comfortable discussing it in any more detail in front of Professor Snape, sir, and now that I've had time to think about it, I'm not particularly inclined to give you the details either. Heart-stopping curse? Septima asked, looking a little frightened of her. Is that really what everyone's worried about? Dumbledore sighed. Hermione, I had hoped you would understand that such a dark curse is not an appropriate tool for someone who opposes Voldemort and his ways. Such a spell is but a shade away from the killing curse. Actually, it's not, sir. Dumbledore looked surprised, but Snape sneered. Really? A spell that passes through a magical shield and stops the heart in one blow isn't dark, Granger? I based it on the Sumerian strike hex, Professor, she said defiantly. The core is dead simple. I added a few dark elements, yes, but no more than are in the bludgeoning curses you yourselves were throwing around. It certainly doesn't take any malicious intent to cast, just good aim. But how? Dumbledore said in disbelief. The human body has its weak points, Headmaster. My parents are medical professionals, so I know them better than most. On impulse, she fixed her eyes on him. I'm sorry if such methods don't meet your approval, Professor. I can't hope to control rivers of fire and storms of glass like you and Voldemort. I need to use more efficient tactics. By now, Septim was looking at her like she almost didn't recognize her anymore. But Snape... Did Snape actually look... impressed? Dumbledore wasn't swayed, though. That was not the issue I was talking about, Hermione. Using such lethal magic is a dark path to start down, especially for one so young. Murder does terrible things to the soul. Murder? Excuse me, sir? She said incredulously. That wasn't murder. That was self-defense. They tried to kill me first, and I responded as necessary to protect my life. A standard that has long been used in court without issue, Snape pointed out. Hermione raised her eyebrows at him. Snape was defending her? Well, she supposed he'd never been too unpleasant towards her when Harry wasn't around, but still. Dumbledore, however, shot Snape a disapproving look and said, But was it really necessary, Hermione? Is it not incumbent upon us to be better than the Death Eaters? We are better, Headmaster, she insisted. We don't torture, we don't discriminate, we don't throw racial slurs or curses that can only be cast with malice. 
"'I know I'm not perfect, sir, but I don't pull punches with self-defense. "'You meet lethal force with lethal force.' "'Dumbledore sighed again. "'You are still young, Hermione. "'With all due respect, sir, this isn't just my opinion. "'This is standard practice in the muggle world. "'Muggles don't carry lethal weapons in this country as a rule, "'but when they do, they're taught that when someone threatens your life, "'you shoot for the heart. "'Not with the goal of killing, but with the goal of stopping the threat "'as quickly as possible with the least risk of collateral damage.' "'Something she'd been specifically researching over the last few months.' With magic, that sometimes means powerful curses that can smash through shields and drop an enemy quickly. And for what it's worth, the trap that Avery was caught in was non-lethal. I'd done the calculations, and if he was a competent wizard and could stop the bleeding, which he seems to have been, I knew it wouldn't kill him. As for Mulsaburn Bellatrix, that was pure self-defense, but... I admit I lost my temper with Dolohov. I used a much darker curse than I needed to bring him down, and yes, I have to deal with that. But it was no more than he deserved... He'd already killed Lee, and he nearly got me too, so I don't regret using potentially lethal spells in return. All three teachers were staring at her by the time she finished her speech. Snape was the first to speak. Well, Albus, if Miss Granger continues to influence Potter as she has been, we might actually have a chance. She is right about muggle firearms, by the way, and it is the same standard our own R's use when it comes down to it. Dumbledore looked between the two of them with a defeated expression. Y "'You are correct, Severus,' he said. "'But it still pains me to see a student driven to such extremes. "'And, Hermione, I must still urge you to exercise extreme caution with any form of dark magic. "'Even if you measured your response in this instance, its corrupting influence is not to be trifled with.' "'I'm well aware of that, sir, but thank you nonetheless,' he nodded. Now, I believe young Harry will be with us soon. Severus Septima, could I ask you to leave at this time? Snape nodded and stood up to leave in silence. Thank you, Professor Snape, Hermione said quickly. He inclined his head again. Don't mention it, he said, and it was clear he meant it literally. And Septima, I didn't mean to scare you, Hermione said. Can we still talk later? Of course, Hermione. The pair left, and Harry arrived a few minutes later. He looked at Hermione questioningly and quietly asked what she had been doing. "'Ethics debate,' she whispered. "'Nothing to worry about.' "'Thank you for coming on such short notice, Harry,' Dumbledore began. "'I was intending to give you a day to recover, but some matters came up that I thought needed to be addressed immediately, so I will try to keep this short. I would like to get the full story about what happened last night. There's a good chance Amelia Bones will ask you to repeat this story in the coming days, but for our own purposes, I think it is important to set the record straight now, if you are comfortable talking about it. Hermione and Harry couldn't exactly say they were comfortable, but they told the story anyway. So, we got on the night bus last night, but it didn't take us home, Harry started. Well, actually, I think it kind of started when the R's came for Hagrid, Hermione corrected. Yeah, I guess. We were taking our astronomy owl, and we saw Umbridge and some R's go to Hagrid's hut. He started again. They told the story as best they remembered it. Dumbledore filled in a few points that they didn't understand as they went. The giant, he said, was Hagrid's half-brother, Grop, who had been exiled from his tribe because he was so small. Small? Hermione said. He recounted the confrontation at Hogwarts to them from the other teacher's report and told them that afterwards Septima had taken umbrage to St. Mungo's and reported both her actions and Hermione's and Harry's kidnapping to the Aurors. Nymphadora Tonks sends his sincere apologies for not arriving sooner, he told them. When Septima told her that Sirius and Remus had those most useful rings of yours, she knew the order would be on its way, so she thought it more important to gather a strong team of ours to respond. Naturally, it took some time to convince them. It might also interest you to know, Harry, that when Dolores Umbridge was questioned this morning, it emerged that she was the one who sent the Dementors to attack you last August. She did what? Hermione yelled. Yes, I know you have a particular aversion to those creatures, Hermione, but it is sadly true, he said. It would seem that her dedication to the law was not quite as pure as she presented it, and she wanted to make the problem go away. In that context, then, perhaps her ill-advised use of the Cruciatus curse last night makes a bit more sense. Hermione muttered something very uncouth under her breath. She wished she'd cursed that vile woman into oblivion when she had the chance. 
The pair then explained how the staff on the night bus had been imperious and forced them off at the ministry, where Malfoy and McNair were waiting for them. Hermione was deliberately vague about how she had produced knockout gas whilst bound and gagged, and it may have implied that it was one of the twins' prank items. They described running through the Department of Mysteries, setting traps, and the battle itself in as much detail as they could remember up until the point Dumbledore arrived. "'And I guess you know the rest, Professor,' Harry said. "'Thank you,' he replied. "'That fills in a few important gaps in my own investigation. "'I shall have to inform Madame Bones to better secure the night bus, "'and I apologize again for not arriving sooner. "'I came as quickly as I could, but I had to visit the Hall of Prophecy first. "'I understand, sir,' Harry said. "'Yes, Professor,' Hermione admitted. "'And I want to commend you for your performance, both of you. "'Even though we may disagree about our methods, "'it is clear that your self-study has paid dividends.' "'Thank you, sir.' Harry said. Professor, Hermione cut in with what she'd been wanting to say for a while. Before we go, I have to ask, why does the Department of Mysteries have brains in a vat? Dumbledore raised an eyebrow. An interesting question, Hermione. Of the many secrets hidden in the Department of Mysteries, that is the one you wish to know about? Sir, the brain in a vat is one of the classic philosophical conundrums in the muggle world. I'm having a bit of an existential crisis here. Ah, I see, he said. He knew how she was about existential crises. If you promise not to divulge it, I can tell you. She agreed at once and elbowed Harry to do the same. The brains, as you call them, are not brains, Dumbledore said. The unspeakables do study the brain, the mind, and the soul, but they do not do so in that room. The aquavirus maggots were, in fact... The unspeakable's ill-fated attempt to restore ghosts to mortal life, an experiment gone badly wrong. That is why they are housed next door to the chamber of death. They are trapped in a form not quite alive, but not quite dead, appearing as brains, but extruding not nerves, but tentacles of pure thought, if you were to look closely. Thus you need not fear a Cartesian demon, most highly powerful and cunning, manipulating the perceptions of disembodied brains imprisoned beneath London. Hermione shivered. His answer was philosophically comforting, but viscerally far more unsettling. Uh, thank you, sir, she said, not quite sure if she meant it. She pondered silently as they made their way back to the infirmary. Severus, have you learned anything more about Dolohov's affliction? Voldemort asked when his spy reported in. The Granger girl admitted that it was an unusually powerful blistering curse, but she refused to divulge details, Snape replied. Privately, he was impressed with Granger's resolve against Dumbledore and was glad she hadn't told him anything. She had been vague enough that there was little harm in revealing that bit. Since Dumbledore taught her occlumency, I couldn't learn no more, my lord. She also claimed the trap that caught Avery was made from mundane cutting wires and that the curse she used on Bellatrix was not a variant of the killing curse, but was based on a simpler spell though he did not reveal which spell it was. "'Interesting,' Voldemort said. "'The mudblood has been a thorn in my side since she entered the magical world, but I'd not thought her capable of such viciousness. And with her friendship with Potter, she could be particularly dangerous. Well, we have ways of dealing with her. Continue doing what you can for Dolohov, Severs. McNair, promote the mudblood to undesirable number two. If she is still alive when we take the ministry, place the same bounty on her as Potter. Yes, my lord, McNair said. Rookwood, you saw the curse the mudblood cast on Bellatrix. Would you be able to reverse engineer it? Rookwood thought it over for a minute. I, I believe it is possible, my lord. See to it at once. Of course, my, uh, my lord, he asked hesitantly. Yes? I could be more confident of recreating it if I had access to a pensieve. Voldemort inclined his head thoughtfully. Pensieves were rare, but collectors of artifacts like schools frequently owned them. Hmm, the traitor Karkaroff should have had one, he mused. Do what you can without one for now. When Dolohov is lucid again, I will have him reach out to his contacts at Durmstrang and inform them they will be greatly rewarded for delivering a working pensieve to me.